be on the recording as well because take a look at your calendars the last one that was published is uh, at the bottom it says 6 8 22 uh so that will have the date today is the end of session section seven and so uh we'll skip next week the regular section break and then the coming back on the 15th, we begin with the intertestament period. I wanted to catch us up in that so-called 400 years of silence because a lot was going on in the world and in Israel and in, in the lives of the people uh, that Malachi left who were written in the book, as we'll see when we get to Malachi, who had to be looking for and be ready for when the Messiah actually did come. So that's an important part. And uh, we see the coming, the promised coming, and then we see the coming. And so I wanted to spend that when we get back from the break, we'll just begin with that. And also, before I forget, um, we have a group that never really comes to class, but watches either a recording only or on YouTube only. One of those is Darlene, who is our um, uh, our uh, Tampa person. So she's been here a couple of times, uh, but she's from Tampa. Does it all? She typically watches on uh, YouTube, I think. But she uh, emailed me to let me know that her brother, while cleaning gutters, fell off a ladder and injured himself pretty bad. He's in the hospital getting surgery and things like that. So we want to remember him in prayer. Um, let's see. Um, his name is Dan. His name is Dan. So, uh, but she had asked for, um, and it, it's interesting, uh, sign of the time, bless her heart. Um, when you have those, that kind of trauma and injuries and so forth and surgery, you're given um, painkillers and her concern is that he won't get hooked on them, which is a common post-op challenge for people these days and uh we need to pay attention to that um medical people are doing more paying attention to that than they used to but um i mean that's that to me when i read that i thought that's a sign of the times that's the days in which we're living so but we'll begin with zachariah and um, hopefully finish up with Malachi, and that will conclude our study of the Old Testament. Now, obviously, we didn't see every page in class. We couldn't discuss every page in class, but um, it's just amazing, even including Esther, that doesn't really mention the Lord per se. It still is the same story all the way through. So beginning with that class, <laughs> now we'll finish up today, but there's no new material really than what we've had. But what would you say is the theme of God's story? We've been reading God's story. What is the theme of God's story. I am the Lord thy God that shall have no other gods before me. Okay, that's good. I am the Lord thy God that will have no other gods before me. From themselves. Okay, yeah. That, but, but what was God's story? Curse. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Great minds think along. <laughs> no. When the Lord created everything, he did it to make a place where he could have a kingdom of people 
who served him like they do in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he created everything to be Eden, a place where he was the king and all who were there would serve him and worship him and live perfectly marvelous lives with no problems. But he also created us with the ability to make a choice to obey what he said and receive the benefits or disobey what he says and suffer the consequences or the curses that come with that. And so from the garden that where the fall occurred, when the situation changed from Eden to outside of Eden, what was then the theme? If you obey me, you will be blessed. If you disobey me, you will be cursed. Now, I hope you have enjoyed the um, sermon series that Jeff is doing now on Abide. Mm -hmm. And I especially appreciated last week. When God, the chapter 15 of John, as he puts up on the thing, that's why, you know, I'm copying him, putting up scripture on the screen and we go, what does the scripture say? When it said, I am the vine and you are the branches. My father is the wine dresser or the one who uh, tends to the, to the vine. And it is he who chooses which branches, the, what, which branches are going to be kept and pruned and continue to grow and which are going to be taken off and thrown away into the fire and what is the decision how does he make the choice what does it say in john if you bear fruit jeff would be pleased that people remember <laughs> but it is so he that it is god who's saying let me look at that life is it fruitful and how does he judge fruitfulness? I believe it is according to our obedience to his word. When God says it, and we believe he will do what he says, just like Abraham, he makes us righteous and then we can bear fruit but we can't until we are made righteous and stuck into the vine there our branch has to be up stuck in the vine so that's the story of the old testament he has gone through and through and through the lives of the people that he has presented and said see what happens when you trust me and obey me Trust and obey have to go together. Belief, faith, all of those are tied up together in obedience. When God says, I'm going to do it and believing he will do it. But, um, and then look at the people whose lives who said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do it my way. What happened? And over and over. And then he looked, showed us the nation that he chose. And what they when they were obedient, how things went, and when they were disobedient, how things went. And we're still looking at that same. He used patriarchs, he used um, prophets, he used kings, he used priests, he used all kinds of people to bring his message. Uh, it was not from want of knowing what God's story was. They were given the story. 
The problem is they chose to obey or not obey. And that's the same choice we have, isn't it? So with that, we'll turn to the prophet Zechariah, uh, some of the last of the prophets who are uh, in that period of time before the so-called silence, uh, when there were no words or messages that came from the Lord until uh, the Lord Jesus came. So we'll begin with, uh, I'll begin with the 12th chapter, but we'll start with sort of an overview of Zechariah just to recall. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us everything we need to know about you that we can learn to trust you and obey you and become yours because you've told us exactly how we can do that, how you will make us righteous. And we want to hear and obey all of your word in our lives and in so, do, in so doing bring glory to you because of who you are and what you've given us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Zechariah wrote in the period of time that we noticed when Ezra was there. Now, we had the um, groups coming. Um Back to the Holy Land, just to recall, the first group was headed by what person? Starts with a Z. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Right. Who's Zerubbabel? Prince. Priest. Why was it Zerubbabel who was chosen to be the governor of this little band of people who came back to the land Why? who was he Why? he's in the first chapter of matthew that's a hint he, he is the seed line he no he was not a levi he no, was in the man. seed line he's the seed seed line <laughs> seed line i'm so sorry <laughs> As soon as I finish paying for my roof, I'm going for hearing aids. <laughs> oh, mercy. I was just telling Charlene this morning, I expect things to work. Like my shower, my car, stuff like that. And I also expect my body to work, but it's not hanging in there so well. <laughs> Zerubbabel is in the seed line of David, meaning um, he would have been king, but there was a declarance by the Lord, a declaration by the Lord with uh, Jehoiachin, who had been captured and taken to Babylon and put into prison and so forth, that even though he has a uh, line that would follow him, he was in the direct line of the King David. Even though he was in that line, no one would sit on the throne of David until the Messiah came because of their sin. So that was already promised, but he was preserved because you had to preserve the seed line all the way up until the Messiah. So it could be Abraham to David to, to Jesus. So that had to be the case, according because when God said, I will, that's, a, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> the next one, and he, he brought about 50,000 people with him. The next group that came was um, some, uh, well, 537 was Zerubbabel, 458 was when Ezra, who is a priest, a Levitic priest in the line of Aaron, and in chapter 7, it describes his his CV, if you will, it tells us exactly his heritage all the way back to Aaron. So we know he is an authentic 
um, position to be a chief priest, and he came back with only about 5,000 people, but m many of them were Levites. He brought the Levites with him, the priest group, so that the people would have, what was Ezra's mission? They built a pulpit for him, and what was Ezra's mission when he came back? He told us in, in seventh chapter what I'm coming for. To worship in the temple? No, that was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel built the temple, but they had to finish up the temple. Um, to teach the Bible? To teach the scripture. I want to teach God's word to these people because they don't know it. Remember, he stood up and he read for six hours from the first hour to the tw till the uh, sixth hour, six hours of, of preaching, reading God's word. And then they had broke into groups and talked about it. What was the response of the people? They wept when they heard God's word and then they sang. So that was his mission. And but only about 5,000 people. Now he had to take a have a couple of prophets help kick butts to finish that temple. Haggai and Zap, uh, Zachariah, who one of them we'll talk about, had to preach to the people to say, You are to build this temple so that the God of Israel, people will see that the God of Israel has a temple in Israel. It wasn't a place to worship because there was no ark there. But it was a place to say the God of Israel is has a temple in Israel to show the rest of the nations around because that was an important thing. Plus, it was their place for them to um, begin teaching all around the areas that they were building their communities their villages and so forth to put a priest in the synagogue there to preach all around there to preach the word uh read the scriptures teach them to the young people coming up the third group comes not too long later in 444 bc and that's nehemiah now who's nehemiah what was his job when he got the Cup he was a cupbearer to who? King who? What's that? Artaxerxes. Remember? And I, I mean, what kind of a king? What empires over them? Persia. Persia. Still Persia. Still Persia. So, but it's many years later. And um, he came, and his job was to do what? Build the wall. <laughs> build the wall. Why build a wall? Around Jerusalem, by the way. It was for safety, but what is the what is the wall designate in a city? Identity identity it is for uh protection walls were built for protection yes but there were not really people in the empire coming against jerusalem anymore in a war like nebuchadnezzar had it wasn't really to protect them from foreign invaders it was to identify this is god's identified this is my city what 444 is the time that uh, began the 62, six, well, it would have been the, uh, the 69 weeks, if you include the first seven, the 69 weeks of Daniel. It was from the decree that goes out to build the wall, that's in the, uh, Daniel's prophecy, and there would be um, there would be 69 weeks until the Messiah. 
would come and do the things that he was to come and do. And that's in the ninth chapter of, of Daniel. So we've been through all of those things. We've been through a lot of prophecy. And the prophecy that was given to Isaiah told us a lot about what's going to happen. But the successive prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all each of them adds to the picture. So we have fleshed out and fleshed out and fleshed out what that day of the Lord is going to look like. Remember? They re that these prophets kept saying there's coming a day of the Lord and each one gives us a little bit more of the picture and we get a little bit, but they're all the same prophecy. There's no, uh, uh, Daniel didn't get a different prophecy than Isaiah or Ezekiel. It's all the same prophecy, but we get added pieces to the puzzle the jigsaw puzzle, and biblical prophecy is somewhat like having a, uh, going to the thrift store and got, buying a bag that has a jigsaw puzzle in it, but there's no box that has the picture. So you pour the pieces and start putting them together, but you have no picture. <laughs> of what it looks like when it's finished. And there may or may not be a couple of pieces missing that you don't quite have to finish out the whole picture. So, but uh, we have a lot of these pictures or pieces of the picture. Okay, so uh, let's go and look. Now, Zechariah is 14 chapters. But it's really divided into three main messages. And Zechariah preached his prophecy during the time that Ezra uh, and the people were building the temple. And it was, and they built it fairly quickly after the prophets began to prophesy and say, you need to build this wall. He and Haggai may have overlapped a little bit. Haggai might have been a little before him and Zechariah a little after. It's not clear on the dates. But the first eight chapters of the book of Zechariah, and this is next to the last book in your Old Testament, um, are prophecy, and they are prophecy in visions or pictures, very much like other prophets uh, preach. And it's very intricate and would take a, a, a whole Bible study to go through. And, and it's an important thing, and I don't want to um, minimize it in any way, but we just don't have time to go through all of, all of those pieces. Chapters 9 through 11 really look specifically um, at the nation of Israel. Um, and then we're going to um, look at 12 through 14, which includes Israel, but expands to the whole world as well. Now, if you get to the prophet uh, Zechariah, You've got a lot of pieces to put in your jigsaw puzzle that'll make that picture quite clear. And it may be pretty much like the center part of your, of your puzzle. You'll have quite a bit of it to be able to see that picture. And it, it's very specific. So that's why I printed out for us to kind of go through um, a little bit, we won't be able to go through every word of it, but most of it, but it has to do with the, the he has, this is the third section of his, of his messages, the third of his three messages, and it really is a continuous message from 12 to 14, and it, uh, as Zechariah does, he uses uh, when he speaks of the Lord, he speaks of the Lord Sabaoth or Yahweh Sabaoth, 
the Lord of the heavenly host or the Lord of uh, heaven's armies. Um, it depends on your translation, but he only almost always refers to him as the the king on the horse with the sash across with a sword in his hand, the mighty warrior Jesus that we read uh, see the picture of in chapter 19 of Revelation. So uh, he sees him as the as a judge, but also as the warrior who um, delivers his people from the enemy. And the enemy of Israel and the enemy of the world is uh, Satan or his kingdom. So uh, let's take a look. Uh, this is probably written, uh, one of the last prophets uh, written in the scripture being in the 5th century or the 400s. Um, and it really is the most complete and the most repeated in prophecies that are given in the New Testament, including um, Revelation. So like all the prophecies, you got to have those before you understand anything about what's in Revelation. So let's take a look and I'll share screen and put up uh, what you have as your handout. And let's just take a look here and just highlight a few, a few things. I tried to uh, highlight certain things, but you, have, you run the risk of when you highlight, everything starts getting important and highlighted and it got all runs together. I don't want to do that, but I do want you to see that this is a message. Now, when a prophet says, I have a message, it always is what the Lord specifically told him to say. So it's as if the Lord is speaking, and that's how we have to hear it. We have to understand that that's what Zechariah is saying. This is what the Lord told me, because there's no way I would know anything about this. This is all future, even to us today. So this is a very important prophecy for us to understand as much as we can. So this is a message. And what is this message about? The fate of Israel. Now, I know when we turn on our news here at home and watch it, it almost never speaks about anything going on in Israel or Jerusalem, right? Because who cares? Unless there's some horrible thing that happens like a bus bombing or something or rockets coming from Gaza or whatever, they might mention it for three seconds on some of the channels, but not even all of them. The world doesn't really care what's going on in Jerusalem. Should we care? Because the fate of the world is wrapped up in the fate of Israel, specifically Jerusalem. And if you read the book of Revelation, you see that that's where the final battle of the final end of the world, as we know it, before the temple comes and the millennial temple comes and the kingdom is on earth and all of that. All of that is Jerusalem. So let's see what Zechariah tells us about that. Now he's telling the people in Israel in the 430s, somewhere around in there, um, this message, and it has been in the Hebrew Bible since then. And so they they know this as well. They know what this is as well. So the fate of Israel, this message is from the Lord. And this is uh, Yahweh. I am the I am. 
And he, it's the one who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. That's how he's identified. I think that's amazing. John did the same sort of in the beginning was the word. And then later on, he said, nothing that was made that was made was made without him making it. <laughs> I messed that up, but nothing that was made, uh, he made everything that was made. And then we begin, I think I counted up 20. I may be wrong in my count, but there, there is a series of I wills. Now, in prophecy, when we have I will, that's something that is going to happen soon in a little bit or a long time from now, but sometime after this statement is made, that's going to happen. So I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations, nearby nations, that is the Middle East as we know it, stagger. When they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah, that is the portion of Israel that surrounds the city of Jerusalem, obviously, that we've talked about. Now, did we read about this same event a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, in the chapter 38 of Ezekiel? What's the name of the guy, the bad guy? Bad, bad, bad man. Gog. Gog, yeah. Okay. Now, what is intoxicating drink and makes them stagger? Makes them drunk. <laughs> when you're drunk, are you using your best judgment skills? But when you say you're drunk with power, you're driven by something. These are people running armies who are not in their right mind, coming against the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding area of Israel, Judah. On that day, I should have highlighted that, Let's just go ahead and do that because I want to point out that we're speaking about that day, meaning not a 24-hour period of time, but a period of time that has been put on God's calendar. When it gets to that point, ding, 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 the alarm and things are set into motion and events that have been talked about by all these prophets are set into motion. And there's not really a chronological thing. There are some sequencing, but there are events that have been described by this prophet or that prophet that are all associated with this day, the day of the Lord, the end of time, essentially, for us. But on that day, I will, now he's the Lord of Heaven's armies is the one speaking this message, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. In other words, all these armies coming against them aren't going to destroy Israel. Not going to get rid of Israel or of Jerusalem. All the nations will gather against it and try to move it but will only hurt themselves. Further, on that day, I will cause every horse to panic. Now, these are word pictures for Zacharias Day, and in the Zacharias Day, the military would ride in on horses, <laughs> chariots, and so forth. Today, they will look more like tanks or whatever moving vehicles uh, they could be, but I will cause every horse to panic and every rider to lose his nerve. I will, we continue to specifically say what God is, says he's going to do, the Lord is going to do. I will watch over the people of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of their enemies. You see the picture that Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 38, they're all going to come 
trying to take uh, this nation, but when they get there, they're going to find they have no power and they're defeated and Israel doesn't do anything. It was done only by the Lord. And we read all of that. Uh, the clans or families of Judah will say to themselves, because they will see all of the events unfold, the people of Jerusalem have found strength in who? The Lord of Heaven's armies. In Hebrew, they would have said Yahweh Sabaoth. And that's how Zechariah refers to him his whole book, even the first portion of the book. Further, on that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a flame that sets a wood pile ablaze. This is a picture, and they will burn up all the neighboring nations right and left while the people living in Jerusalem will remain secure. So what's happening to all the nations that surround Israel? They're going to be burned so to speak, or destroyed by the people of Jerusalem. When you set pots of fire in wood piles all over the place, what happens to those wood piles? They burn up. That's the picture we see. Further, the Lord, this is Sabaoth, will give victory to the rest of Judah first before Jerusalem so that the people of Jerusalem and the royal line of David and Zechariah is very careful like Ezekiel to speak about the royal line of David now what does that tell you now speaking way in the future even to us what does that say That there's still someone of that line living Somebody from that line is still there whether they know who they are or not god does does that mean that the prophecy to david that the lord gave him in the seventh chapter of first samuel does that mean that that comes true i will put on that throne a king forever. That's my throne forever on earth. This is a forever thing. There, of the people of the royal line of David will not have greater honor than the rest of Judah, meaning there's a royal line that's there, but they are not over royally speaking if you will like a king would be over and get better things than the regular people the regular people will um be treated the same on that day who's going to defend israel lord. and jerusalem the lord and the weakest among them will be as mighty as king david remember david fought and fought and fought <laughs> David was never wounded, ever wounded in battle, ever. And his first battle was with Goliath. He was never wounded in battle. The royal descendants will be like God, like the angel of the Lord who goes before them. On that day, I will begin to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Are we considered the regular people? Is that the, is that we're, the we're considered regular people. Yeah. We're not royalty. But he put it. Because of the cross, there's no difference okay. in the Jews. See, Charlie, it could be that because of the cross, there's no difference. It, it speaks of a... Um, city of people it does not really say um who those royal descendants are but there are royal descendants and regular people in the city and they're treated the same okay further what else after he is um on, i will begin to destroy all the nations and then that's a sequence. Then 
I will what? Pour out a spirit of grace and prayer. Look at that. What is a spirit of grace and prayer? Well, let's finish the thought that Zechariah gives us. On the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. So everybody in the city. They, family of David, the ones, the royal descendants, them, I tried to highlight so we can follow the pronouns there. That's an important thing to keep our pronouns. And they who have had their the spirit of grace and power poured out on them. What will they do? After that spirit is poured out on them, what will they do? Look on me. The one who's speaking me is the Lord, whom they have pierced and mourn for him as the only son. First time we even heard of that, was Isaiah 200 years before more than that probably 300 years by now so that prophecy is going to happen when after the Lord begins to destroy all the nations because it's I will begin to destroy all the nations that come against uh, Jerusalem Jerusalem is the hot spot of the world and the future of this earth depends on what's going on in Jerusalem. Don't you think we ought to pay attention to what's going on in Jerusalem? Are they more or less bugging people around the world? Because that's what brings things happening. So... He's going to make it possible for the people who live in Jerusalem, who've been preserved through these battles, to have a eyes to see. They'll have a spirit poured out on them so that they will be able to look on him and recognize who that is that is saving them. The one they pierced and mourned. They will grieve bitterly. And the sorrow and mourning in Jerusalem on that day will be great like the mourning of hated women in the valley of Megiddo. Not clear. I wasn't able to find that uh, location anyplace else in scripture. But Megiddo is the, is the area where Armageddon will be. But Megiddo has been the site of many battles um, in Israel's history, which, uh, which were devastating battles for groups of people on either side. All Israel will mourn. Not only the people of the city of Jerusalem, but all Israel. And how will they do? Each clan, each family by itself, with the husbands separate from their wives. It's an interesting picture that Zechariah is painting here of the kind of mourning it is personal and individual and as if it's private. Um, because men and women often uh, mourn differently and express themselves differently. Apparently, they're going to separate themselves. The clan of David will mourn alone, as with the clan of Nathan, the clan of Levi, the clan of Shimei. Those are various um, groups that will separate themselves and uh, mourn separately. After the spirit has been poured out on them and they look on him whom they have pierced. Further, each of the surviving clans from Judah will mourn separately with the husbands separate from their wives. Um, this is just part of the prophecy. And then further, don't think about the chapter changing because it's a continuing of the, of the message that Zechariah has given. On that day, 
a fountain will be opened for the dynasty of David. And for the people of Jerusalem, and what will this fountain do? Cleanse them from all their sins and impurity. There is a fountain filled with blood. There's going to be a fountain open. What does this mean? Do you think this is when Paul said, in a day, all Israel will be saved? Romans chapter uh, 9 through 11, he specifically speaks about this time. On that day, there's a lot of things happening in that period of time, aren't there? Battles, spirit being poured out, a fountain being opened. Then further, on that day, says the Lord of armies, I will erase idol worship throughout the land. That means there's still idol worship to be removed. They don't look like the idols of the old Israelites, I'm sure, but they're still, they're still idol worship. So that even the names of the idols will be forgotten. It may be the uh, wealth, position, power, influence, whatever thing is foremost in, in those people. I will remove from both the false prophet, the land, both the false prophets and the spirit of impurity that came with them. And then there's a period, and I'll move through this here, that um, those who could, who prophesy, who said they were prophets, who are living in the land today, up until that time, if they were false prophets, they're going to be recognized as false prophets at this time. And even their own father and mother will tell them, you must die for you have prophesied lies in the name of the Lord. The, the false prophets will be identified and destroyed as well. And people will say, I'm not a prophet. I have no idea about prophecy. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I'm just a farmer. And then he goes into a, a period of poetry. Now, what have we learned in the Old Testament scripture? The difference when the Lord speaks in poetry as well as, as when he speaks in prose. Anybody remember? Emotion, well, it's from the heart of God, his feeling, and the other is from the mind of God. Now, obviously, there you can't separate people's minds and their hearts and so forth, but there is a way of expressing that's more from the heart and usually musical and rhythmic and so forth, and the prose is a little more... Um, theory and theological and that sort of thing. But that is very much the case. So he suddenly switches from a narrative of prose to a poem. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner. Hmm. Not quite sure who that shepherd is, but there is a sword the man who is my partner, says the Lord of armies, strike down the shepherd, that guy right there, whoever that is, strike down that shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I, the Lord, will turn against the lambs. Reading what it says there. When that happens... Two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die. But one-third will be left in the land. Now, this is after that initial battle in which they were all preserved, remember, in the city. 
And then they have the opportunity to have the spirit poured out of them and they can, those who look and profess or repent and realize that that's the Lord that they pierced and respond to that. After this period of time, or this may be a repeat in a different way of the same period of time, two thirds of Israel, the land, will be cut off the people in the land, two thirds of the population and one third of the population will remain. That group, that one third, this is why it's so important to track your pronouns. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. What's the New Testament word for that process of bringing them through the fire and making them pure? Tribulation. Is it uh, refine? Sorry? Refine? Refine is the next thing, but that is the period of when you bring someone through the fire mm -hmm. and make them pure, that's tribulation persecution okay sir i will refine them the same group like silver and purify them like gold so they're going to be brought through the fire to make be made pure and then he's going to refine them further to make them like pure silver or pure gold and they same group will call on my name and I will answer them. That's a preserved remnant which will go through all of the ends of the days and emerge. And these will be the ones who come with the Lord Jesus into his temple, the temple that we read about in Ezekiel, the millennial temple and the millennial city and the millennial time of, of those tribes. And I, the Lord Sabaoth, say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Have that picture? Watch. For the day of the Lord is coming when your possessions and this this may be a repeat or just an embellishing of the of the uh, message as it's already been said. Um, when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you, I will gather all the nations against. Now this isn't just the surrounding nations this time. This is all the nations. And that's the way it's referred to in uh, the 16th chapter of Revelation in Armageddon. All the nations are brought against Jerusalem. The city will be taken. Ah, different, isn't it? Because the last war, the city was preserved. And the people who came through it were put through the fire, so to speak. And now we have uh the houses will be taken the looted the women raped half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city there is a place in the 16th chapter of revelation that refers to those who are supposed to go into captivity will go into captivity and those who were to be uh killed will be killed and the city will be left in ruins Then, this is the end. The Lord, who's going to fight? The Lord, the warrior Jesus, will go out and fight against those nations, all the nations that came against Jerusalem, as he fought in the times past. On that day, this is a little bit different time now after the destruction. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And when they stand on the Mount of Olives, that's that mountain east of Jerusalem, it will split apart. 
half will move to the north and half will move to the south so that there's a valley that runs east-west right through that mountain. Remember the earthquake that was felt all over the world that Ezekiel told us about? That's what has just happened. Remember the stream that runs out from under the temple that goes all the way to the Dead Sea? The prophets don't get different messages. They get the same message, but some prophets get a little bit more information than the others. This is the only prophecy in which we read about this mountain being split in two. We read that an earthquake happened that was felt all over the world. Remember that in Ezekiel 39? You. Go back up to who are we talking about? Those who, that one third who remained, who were refined by fire and purified and so forth, that's the you, that group, will flee through this valley and will reach across to Azal. Azal, Azal. <laughs> yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah. Amos spoke about that when he wrote his prophecy. Remember that earthquake when we all fled in the days of King Uzziah? Then the Lord, my God, will come and all his holy ones with him. What does that sound like? Rapture, doesn't it? <laughs> Isn't this the coming of the Lord? The Lord Jesus coming? So it's after the rapture? Or who knows? <laughs> then, we've got a lot of thens that refer to which kind of sequences events in the message, right? We've had this happen, then this happened, then this happened, then... So this is at the end of the Lord fighting against those nations. Then the Lord walked with all his holy ones. Now that's almost the quote from Revelation 19 when he comes with his horses and his um, the heavenly army on horses with him. Now I read that to be angels. Those who are pre-millennial or pre-trib rapture people believe that that's the people who were raptured seven years ago coming back. I don't read it that way, but read for yourself the scripture. Those who have eyes to see, but when you see it almost repeated the same way in the book of Revelation, it's when the battle which is in the 16th chapter of Revelation, the Battle of Armageddon. After that, the we see the Lord on the white horse with the, uh, the sash and the written on his thigh and the sword and all that whole description is there. So I think those holy ones, because almost never in scripture are human being groups called holy ones, heavenly ones, angels on that day the sources of light will no longer shine hmm something very supernatural is going to happen what are our sources of light the sun and the moon what have we heard all along in these prophecies is going to happen with the sun and the moon they're going to go dark Yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. Zechariah is a good guy. I don't know. That's what he told me. Only he knows how this is. There will be no normal day or night, for at evening time it will still be light. 
on that day, life-giving water will flow out of Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. Now, that would be an absolute miracle in the nation of Israel, especially Jerusalem, which has one little spring water source, but has rain very rarely. And the uh, the places where the water would travel in a river dry up in between because there's so little rain, there are no rivers really around Jerusalem. So this is a totally different landscape. But remember, if something happened to split the mountain, it changed all of the geography because that mountain is right across the valley from Jerusalem. I mean, you can stand on one and see the other very easily. So a lot of big supernatural things are going to happen. The Lord will be king over all the earth on that day. There will be one Lord, and his name alone will be worshipped. What has just happened? <laughs> thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I will, I will, I will, I will. Thy will be done. And then it tells us about the changes in the land, that the geography in the land is all going to be different, and Jerusalem will be filled, safe at last, never again to be cursed and destroyed. And he finishes with that. And all those folks who are still alive after all of these final battles have happened, if those folks who are outside the city, outside the land, who are still alive, the Lord is going to send a plague on all those nations that fought against Jerusalem. And think of uh, when uh, Indiana Jones came and found, and they found the Ark of the Covenant and on the movie, and they touched it tried to get into it, and what happened? They melted. That's a picture I see when I read this. They're, they're, they will be like walking corpses, their flesh rotting away, their eyes will rot in the sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. That's also in Revelation. They will be terrified, stricken by the Lord with great panic, and they will fight their neighbors hand to hand. The end almost. <laughs> Judah, too, will be fighting at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the neighboring nations will be captured. Great quantities of gold and silver and fine clothing. All the... Um, bounty from, from the defeated nations. In the end, and I should have highlighted that one. In the end, now, this is not on that day. This is in the end. Things are done now. The enemies of Jerusalem who survived the plague will go up to Jerusalem each year to worship the king, the Lord of heaven's armies, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the seventh month feast for the ingathering. It's a, a very celebratory feast of Israel. And it is when um, everyone in Israel comes together and celebrates uh, the deliverance of the Lord. That's the seventh month final um fulfilling of the festivals and feasts that were spoken about in the book of Leviticus. And uh, any nation, now, how are they going to come and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What's there to worship? Ezekiel spent eight chapters in the end of his book describing it. The temple, the millennial temple is there. 
And that's where they will come every year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Any nation in the world that refuses to come to Jerusalem to worship will have no rain. That's the curse for disobedience. You have no rain, you have famine, drought, death, destruction, uh, plague. Egypt and the other nations will all be punished if they don't celebrate the Feast of Shelters or Tabernacles. It depends on your translation. On that day, even the harness bells of the horses will be inscribed with these words, holy to the Lord. Everything in Jerusalem is made special, holy, that is separated and set apart to use in the worship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who's now sitting on that throne. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be made holy to the Lord. In other words, everything there is like if it was temple or tabernacle um, instruments or, or um, like the pots and, and chalices and things that were used to worship. All who come to worship will be free to use any of these pots to boil their sacrifices. On that day, there will be no longer, will no longer be traitors in the temple of the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, what did the Lord Jesus do at least twice, maybe more, but we're recorded in the New Testament. What did he do when he came to the temple? First thing. With a whip drove out the money changers. Why? They were using the house of the Lord as if it were a marketplace mm -hmm. and making themselves wealthy and dishonoring the Lord's house. That's never going to happen again. And that's all of that's all of Zechariah's prophecy. What do you think? Do we know what to look for? Should we be able to recognize it? I would very much encourage you to find online ways of looking at what's going on in the local news in Jerusalem. Might give you a heads up. And to look at every world event from now on as, hmm, how does this fit in? It's not going to be Russia that runs the world. It's not going to be China that runs the world. It's not going to be America that runs the world. It's going to be Jerusalem. Why? Because when David captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and set it up, the Lord said, that is my city forever. That's my city forever. And when he says it's forever, he being eternal can determine that it is forever. You see that? That's the end of that sort of prophecy in the scripture. But we have no doubts of what it says, do we? I mean, it's pretty clear. And now we'll look at Malachi. And we can't again look at the whole book, but I thought I would try to pick out what, for me, is maybe the most important part. But Malachi is the last book in our Bible. It was not the last book in the Hebrew Bible. Chronicles was. Nehemiah might have been the last one written or about the last one written. But Malachi would have been written maybe the end or near the end. It's way at the end. And 
the remarkable thing about this book is we turn, we'll look at the third and uh, fourth chapters. There's not very many verses there. But as we turn to the book of Malachi, think about this. Now, recall, uh, Nehemiah came, they built the wall, they did a lot of work. What was his big problem? Nehemiah's big problem that they were dealing with? Who, who was trying to keep him from building the wall? He named the enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, with the people, the enemies, the living in the land. This is our land. We've been here all the time you were in exile. And when they came back, they tried to keep them from building it. But Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the wall around I, the city of God. This is God's city. He wants a wall around it to, as I the identity, the place, the identity. It was not just a little village. Now it was in ruins and it took a lot of work and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the walls and they're going and they had a lot of problems with marrying foreign wives. Remember Ezra had to work on that. Nehemiah did too. Well, that was a 12 year period of time from the time that Nehemiah came and they built the walls and so forth. And remember, um, uh, Artaxerxes said uh, to Nehemiah, yeah, you can go, but you got to come back. Mm -hmm. So after the 12 years, Nehemiah went back to um, uh, the Persian king's place, the palace. Uh, and probably picked up his service, maybe gave reports and so forth. And we don't know how long he was back home, but he came back to Jerusalem after a period of time. Between that period of time is when Malachi did his prophecy and wrote to the people. So it was that time that the conditions at that time when Nehemiah was away and the people were just living with no prophet except perhaps Malachi and they were being, uh, they had uh, synagogues and priests and so forth. And, and the Judah was surrounding and well-developed. They had built up their homes and their farms and developed things pretty well. There was not much enemy activity, but there was still the problem of um, the kind of worship. And so that period of time is not clear how long is when Malachi did his prophecy. So he was probably by himself as far as all of these other people. Ezra was gone. Haggai was gone. Nehemiah wasn't there. He came back eventually, perhaps, but we don't have that clear. So about 432, 431, somewhere around in there is where uh, he wrote. Now, the first thing you need to note is this whole book is prose. There's not one bit of, pro of poetry. And that's unusual for a prophet. Meaning, God, the Lord, has lost his feeling for these people. And why? Because of their absence of righteous worship and righteous living and obedience. They were offering the leftovers for their sacrifices, the animals that they would have gotten rid of anyway because they were injured or sick or whatever. They were not... Uh, worshiping that they were not keeping. Now, I'm speaking of the nation as a whole. And I, I don't know how many were in Judah and Jerusalem at that time, but there were several hundred thousand probably, not uh, huge, but plenty of people. And so poor Malachi has to speak to this. And so his preaching was to a really tough 
audience. And let me just sum up before we look at chapter three and and continue from there, because that's his real prophecy uh, in Malachi. But he these are under Persian kings still. They they are about uh, maybe a hundred or more years from returning from exile. So they've had plenty of time uh, to stay in the land and um, begin worshiping anew and so forth, and yet they were not. Now, they're a tough audience. I listed all the things that um, were described by Malachi as he described the people. They were disillusioned, cynical, callous, dishonest, apathetic, doubting, skeptical, and outright wicked. How would you like for that to be your congregation that you're preaching to? They don't care if you're talking to them or not as a group. Now, we're speaking of the whole group because that wasn't true of everyone in the group, but it was the true of the nation of Israel at this time. Added to that, their priesthood was totally corrupt. And it would stay corrupt until the temple was again destroyed in 70 AD. So the Lord Jesus was born into a corrupt priesthood. And we saw that. They were described ultimately as a faithless people headed for judgment. And yet the message of Malachi is from the Lord. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Despite all of these things, I have loved you. And he goes through that over and over and over again to explain it. Now, there's a lot of questions when the Lord says, I do, and they respond back, well, how did you love us? And so forth. There was a lot of skepticism and arguing and um, generally not trusting who the Lord is and not understanding who he is. But through it all, God said, I love you. And we come to the third chapter of uh, Malachi, Malachi, I keep thinking of. Uh, Malachi, somebody told me his name is Malachi. I mean, they, that's how they called it. And I that was stuck in my head because it's so weird. If he were Italian, maybe. <laughs> Now, the thing to note is Malachi is a Hebrew word for my messenger. It is not his name. We don't even know this man's name. We don't know his parents. We don't know his tribe. We don't know how old he is, any of the characteristics that many of the prophets have told us about. There literally is nothing that says, but um, he describes himself as the prophet told to give them the, these messages. And so he has preached to them about what's, what's wrong, what they're doing wrong, and they're headed for judgment because of their faithless. And then he... Um, begins a whole different tone with the third chapter, and he begins, look, or behold, depends on your translation, but it's pay attention. And again, I highlight trying to make sure our pronouns add up so we know who's saying what, to whom kind of thing is so important for us. I, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, he also speaks of him very much like Zechariah, and that's what makes me think that Malachi and Zechariah knew each other, uh, whoever Mal Malachi is, um, 
uh, knew each other, but we we don't know for sure. But that's how he's referred to. The Lord of Heaven's armies is a a Lord who comes as a warrior, not as a baby. <laughs> so, uh, and he's really not called a Messiah in this uh, book at all. He's really only referred to as the Lord of Heaven's army. And let's read the the uh, the paragraph. Uh, carefully because this is how he in introduces it and this will mark the beginning as i've said here the so-called 400 odd years of silence which was not there was not another word from the lord until john the baptist came and he said behold the lamb of god in john chapter one did you all read that this weekend in your connection groups or small groups that's who the world was waiting on that malachi calls my messenger the lord's messenger my messenger the one who's going to bring a message from me to you and he the messenger will prepare the way before me the Lord of heaven's armies. See where it says that? We know who we're talking about. So who's John preparing the way for? Jesus. Clearly spoken of in the New Testament that way. He was sent to have one single task in his entire life, and he was born for that. And we read about that in chapter one of Luke. It's the only place we really see the whole story from his father and mother all the way through his birth and so forth. We don't have much. Um, but now, before we go anymore, turn in your scripture, if you have it, to Matthew 11 or in your little book uh, <clears throat> to page. Um, 1131, page 1131, this is Matthew chapter 11, and this is the Lord Jesus speaking, when I, when I get to the place to read, it'll be down in verse, um, uh, we'll begin with um, verse 8, but this is uh, the Lord Jesus talking to his disciples, and the disciples of John come to speak to the disciples and Jesus, John is in prison and he has sent his followers, John the Baptist followers, to the Lord Jesus to ask a very important question, which he was concerned about while he was in prison. And um, Jesus gives the reply in verse four, go tell him, Yes, I'm the one that was that you were sent to to prepare the way for. Because I think John was saying, "What am I doing in prison? I'm not able to prepare the way for the Lord here." But he was put in prison because his job had been done. But he was a little concerned, and he the Lord Jesus reassured him. And Jesus told the disciples that John had sent, "Go back and tell him this." And then verse 7, as those men, John's disciples, went back to talk to John, Jesus begins to talk to the crowd that has surrounded him, because there was always a crowd around him um, whenever he spoke. And, um, and they began to speak about John, because that was the topic of discussion at that time. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in his soft clothes? Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. The crowds went out to see John when he was baptizing because he was a prophet. They didn't go out to see a, a educated wearing fine clothes type person who is preaching they went out to see a prophet 
because that's what John said. I've been sent to prepare the way. And so he goes on. Uh, yes, this is continuing in verse 9 of chapter 11 in Matthew. Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet, this is Jesus speaking about John. This is the one that is written about, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. Do you see that quote from Malachi? He will prepare your way before you. The Lord Jesus continues, I assure you, among those born of women, no greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. The violence have been seized by force for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, look at this, this is Jesus speaking. He, John, is the Elijah who is to come. Anyone who has ears to hear, listen. What did Jesus say? If you believe it, he is that one, John is the one who was sent, who was called Elijah by Malachi. So is Elijah still coming? Is he coming or has he come? He's come. He's come. Jesus said, if you're willing to believe me, he's the one who was sent to prepare the way for me. Meaning, I'm the one John prepared the way for. You there? Okay. So let's go back to Malachi 3. Then, after the message has been sent to prepare the way, after the messenger has been sent to prepare the way, then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. Hmm. When did he come to his temple the first time? Was it times 12? Well, we have one little piece recorded when he was 12 years old he was found in the temple and he said i must be about my father's business but he came in his um messiah role the first time when he after his baptism and after, on the first passover of his ministry he came to Jerusalem to observe the Passover, as all men of, of Israel had to do. And it was when he entered the temple was the first time he cleared it out with force. I think that might be the time that he's speaking about. The messenger of the covenant, hmm, whom you look so eagerly, is surely coming. Now, what is the messenger of the covenant? The one who will tell you about the covenant, the messenger. The old covenant is gone. What did Jeremiah call saying was going to happen? Now, I know you've read Jeremiah 31 many times. And to what does he refer? Now, this is why when you read God's story and understand that it is the same story start to finish, he is continuing with it, giving us more and more information as we get more and more re revelation. But what was the covenant that the Lord Jesus brought? He said what it was at, at the um, Last Supper. The new covenant. 
I am the covenant, the new covenant that Jeremiah told you about. I'm the covenant. And what is that covenant? How did he seal his covenant? I know their hearts. With his blood and his body. Me, I'm the covenant. Broken for you, bleeding for you. So that's in John, John's gospel as well. But look at the rest of this uh, section here. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? It. What is it? I didn't highlight it because I wanted to pay attention to it. But I, uh, the message of the covenant whom you look so eagerly is surely coming. Who will be endure, able to endure it? The message of the covenant? You there? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? He will be like a blazing fire that refines metal and like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver so that they might once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. So his message was quite um, refining, wasn't it? Then, once more, the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. At that time, when all of this stuff happens, at this time, I will put you on trial. I am eager to witness against all of the sorcerers and adulterers and liars. I, that's the Lord Jesus speaking, I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows, wi uh, widows and orphans, or deprive the foreigners living among you of justice for those who, uh, these people do not fear me, do not fear me, says the Lord of armies. Now, what is he saying here? What did the Lord Jesus say in his uh, Sermon on the Mount and all of his sermons? He spoke against the evil way the Pharisees were treating the people and the Levites were treating the people because they uh, and the people were cheating each other, um, oppressing the widows and orphans. They were not functioning um, as they should as people of the Lord, how they are to treat each other. Um, people of, of Israel were supposed to treat each other according to the uh, law. Uh, this is all uh, in um, Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 61 when, he, when it says, I came to um, set the prisoners free, the captives free, the uh, ones in chains, the blind, all of those, uh, that was his mission. That's what he's speaking of here. This is his first ministry. He came to witness against all of those. This is the Lord witnessing. The Zechariah is judgment. This is not judgment. This is witnessing and preaching uh, what they were doing wrong that needed to be made right. I am the Lord, should be highlighted. I miss them occasionally. There's so many of them. I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Now, what does that say? He still loves them. You have been evil since Jacob. 
but I made a covenant with Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, which was a forever covenant. And I made it and it is unbreakable. I do not change. Therefore, you're still alive. If it wasn't because I made a covenant with Abraham, you'd be dead and wiped out as a people, people group. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now, return to me and I will return to you. That's Malachi's preaching to a wayward people. And again, the same theme as in all of Malachi is, well, when were we ever? How can we return when we were never gone away? Of course you were. Should people cheat God? <clears throat> you cheated me. But you ask, well, what do you mean? People have the audacity to argue with God. Don't know who he is very well, do they? When did you ever cheat? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me all the tithes and offerings due me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. They were under a curse for 400 years. No message from the Lord. Because they were cheating. And then he offers them, he said, look, bring all your tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food for my temple. That is supporting the work among the nation that should come from this temple. If you do so, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open up the windows of heaven to you. That's blessed you abundantly. I will pour out blessings so great you won't be able to make room for it. Try me. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant. I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they're ripe. Then all the nations will call you blessed. They had a chance again, but they did not do it. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord, but you say, what do you mean? The whole book is filled with that back and forth kinds of questioning and, the, and God answering. What have we said against you? You have said, what use, what's the use of serving God? In other words, if I serve God, it makes no difference between me and the ones who don't serve God. So why bother? That's how the people were viewing it. But look at this, and I'm hurrying up because of the time. I want to spend a few minutes with this. Verse 16 of chapter 3. Let's look at this carefully. Then, in the message, continuing. Those who feared the Lord spoke with each other. Malachi's given this message, and there's a lot of yan yan back and forth asking, when, when do we do that and all that back and forth but there were those who feared the lord now what does feared the lord mean that's something we've talked about since the beginning of this class we've talked about the fear of the lord what does that mean reverence. it's more than reverence it is reverence but it's more than reverence what did the Lord say to those who uh, when they were when the Lord Jesus in Matthew 10, if you still have your finger in the in the Bible, you go back um 1030, I think it is in your 1130 in your little book. Look at Matthew 10, 28, when they were challenging the Lord Jesus. Don't worry about the people who can kill you. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Why? Why fear the Lord? Mm -hmm. 
It's the same thing as trust, believe, obey, hold a very high, awesome reverence. Yes, why? What can the Lord do that no other entity can do? Determine your eternity. When he inspects the branch, does it have fruit on it or not? Amen. Fear him. Why? Because your eternal soul depends on it. There were those who did not fear the Lord in Israel, whose Malachi was spoken, speaking to, but there were those who did fear the Lord. Does he know the, who those people are? Absolutely. They got together and spoke with each other when hearing this message from Malachi. And what did they do? Let's stay faithful to the Lord. Fellowshipping in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament with those together who also fear the Lord helps each other understand what that means and keeps, keeps us faithful. Test us, keeps us accountable. And they got together and decided we're going to fear the Lord. All the rest of you can offer the wrong sacrifices and not pay the right tithes and do all the things you want, but we're going to fear the Lord. There's a group of people who did that. Look at that. This is the only place this whole scenario is recorded in scripture. The Lord listened to what this group said amongst themselves. You think the Lord knows what we're saying amongst ourselves in our groups? He's there. In his presence. Where's the Lord at this particular time when he's listening? He's sitting on his throne in heaven. That's where his presence is. A scroll of remembrance was written to record whose names? This bunch of people who heard the message from Malachi and got together amongst themselves and said, we're going to fear the Lord. Look at this. Look at this carefully. Because this is what lasted Israel all the way through those 400 years for when Mary and Joseph brought that tiny baby to the temple to be dedicated on the eighth day of his life. And who was there? Simeon and Adam. This is the one you told us was coming, Simeon said. Anna said, I have prayed for him all my 80 years. That's what this group of people being faithful and fearing the Lord and raising their children and their children's children all through those generations until Simeon, who was an old man by then. That's how come there were faithful people in Israel. Joseph, Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah. We have a few names. There were many more that we don't know, but the Lord knows. Where are they written down? He's got a special book. Look at that. Look at that. Those who feared him and what? How long? Always. Faithful. Faithful always throughout and they thought about the honor of his name they honored the lord jesus they obeyed they blessed 
They believed. They were faithful. They trusted. God people. That's the tiny remnant or however big it was at this time and however big it ever is. God always keeps a group of his people faithful. That same group, and that's why I highlight the pronoun, that same group will be who? From now on, when we think of my people, and it's true, for, he's described them that, my people are those who identified, and they're the ones who are mine. The Lord knows who he is. On that day when I act in judgment, didn't we just talk about that day? They will be my own special treasure. So when the two-thirds are killed and the one-third remains, who's that? Fear the Lord. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Is it could it be any clearer how the Lord has worked this thing through? Yeah, he didn't speak to him through a prophet for 400 years, but what had he prepared? He had a group of people who feared him. And their names were written and kept. Then they were his. He cared for them as an obedient child. And that could have been the whole nation. Hmm? That could have been it the whole could have been the whole nation, but they didn't. The Lord of Army says the day of judgment is coming. Malachi just had read, I'm sure, for himself, that whole book of Zechariah, which he had probably completed by the time Malachi was speaking of this. The day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. Isn't that what Zechariah just said in that portion that was the poem? They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. But who? You who fear my name. Now, you have to read this carefully. It doesn't say S-O-N. It says S-U-N. How does the sun cover the earth? When it rises, it covers the whole earth there's not a place on the earth that is where the sun is shining that is not there i mean you can get in the shade and so forth but the sun is shining still the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings that is in the rays of the sun the healing that means it will spread absolutely like the sun shines over the entire earth and you, those who fear the Lord, that's we got to keep keep in mind who he's talking about. You who fear the Lord will go free. And how will you act? Leaping like the joy, with joy like calves led out to pasture. And if you read or hear people who speak, uh, who are farmers who have to store their cattle in the barns during the winter because of the of the cold and so forth, and that in the spring comes and it's warm enough to let them out, literally the old cows just jumping around. Can you see these big old fat cows jumping around? Because they're glad to get out of that barn into the sun. On that day, I will act. You will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord. The very end of scripture that we know by a prophet, given by a prophet, reads this. Remember some admonitions that this prophet is telling people. Remember to obey God's law. My servant the, was given my law, 
all the decrees, regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah. Jesus explained who that is. So we know who that is. I will send that before the great and dreadful day the Lord arrives. Well, is he going to wait until the second time he comes? The great and dreadful day? The great and dreadful day, I believe, is when the Lord came the first time. Because that was when they rejected him and he had to be killed on the cross. It was a dreadful day. Good, obviously, and required for us, but it was a dreadful day. But what does it describe when the Lord arrives? His preaching. Now, it's not talking about judgment here. His preaching, right? Isn't that what the Lord Jesus did? When he came, he preached all everywhere he went. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. The Lord Jesus preached and he preached. And what did they do? Except for a few, they rejected him. It had already been prepared that the Lord would come and go to the cross, and he knew that. That's why he came. But what happened to the nation of Israel as a result of their rejecting? It was destroyed again, cursed again. And they lived through thousands of years of being under a curse until they just recently returned to the land and Jerusalem was made the capital of the, of the nation of Israel only a few years ago. And the world hates Jews. Still. Jerusalem is a stumbling block and it makes people drunk with we're going to just, just go over and, and kill everybody in Israel and bomb them and get rid of them and push them into the ocean, to the Mediterranean Sea. Well, that's the end of the Old Testament. Was God finished with what he was planning to do? We'll have to skip a week, but begin to read uh, the Gospels and start reading. And I put in the um, in the outline one little note, which next section will be split because of the of the holidays and and the the times we'll have to miss it around Christmas time. But I put a thought in there, which I was hoping might be um, helpful. I don't know if I shared that or not. Uh, but I don't know if if um, it, it would be something you want to do, but I found it most helpful instead of reading chronologically like your little one has it where you read the same event sort of things in four different places or three different places depending on how many places they're recorded in other words feeding the five thousand is recorded in all five go four gospels i found it helpful to just read matthew start to finish then read mark start to finish and then read luke start to finish and read john start to finish while they do refer to the same events many places, it is really a very unique point of view for each gospel writer. And it is meant to give a fuller picture of who Jesus is. He is a king. He's a servant. He's a savior. All of uh, he's a, a prophet and priest and all of those things, and you get a fuller picture of the kingdom that he he brought. The kingdom is at hand, but 
you'll have time. And just looking ahead, remember Tuesday, the 22nd of November. It's hard to believe we today's only the first, but thank you. <laughs> The 22nd is the churchwide Thanksgiving time for evening Tuesday. So we'll do Zoom only on that day. Zoom only on that day. So what are your comments about these marvelous prophets? Thankfully, we had faithful prophets who recorded everything for us and gave us a lot of information. Um, the different gates that are talked about, the different gates, the water gate, the fish. Oh, the gates in the in the um, temple. Yeah, and the city. That's Ezekiel forty through forty eight. There were gates from the very beginning, from David. There were gates. The wall was around solid, and and it was very high and very thick. So. You had to have gates to get out of the city to go to other places in the wall. And the gate was named by what that gate was used to go through. So they would have the so-called dung gate, which is where you dumped out all the garbage into the valley um, at the at the foot of Jerusalem so that that was the Valley of Hinnon that was constantly burning to get rid of the, you had the uh, Eastern Gate, which went over to the Mount of Olives. You, you had various gates and there were 12 gates or sometimes more. And Nehemiah had to repair all those gates because they had been burned by Nebuchadnezzar. So, and they, uh, uh, when, uh, over the years, when the wall was repaired and so forth, some of the gates were remained and others didn't. So, yeah. but the city is no longer walled around like it was. So, there are the archaeologically, you can find some of the places where those gates were. But, do you have of sources to keep tabs on Israel? Sources to keep tabs on Israel. Let me share screen with um, I'm putting up YouTube and uh, one source Do you see his name Amir Safadi? He is a huh? excellent source for me. He has a podcast. He's on Telegram. He's on, he publishes on uh, YouTube. He speaks all over the world, really. T-S-A-R-F-A-T-I. Is he the same Amir that wrote Revealing Revelation? Yes, recent. Read, I, recent read, I just yes. read that. He's written several books. Yeah. That some novels. Great. Some novels. Um, you know, um, stories, you yeah. know. Now, he is a Messianic uh, Jew, so to speak, but he does not describe himself. He is a Christian who is, happens to be a Jew. He was born in Jerusalem, and it, you can go on his website, and um, his website is called Behold Israel. Behold Israel. Now, uh, he also speaks on Channel 7 in Jerusalem. Channel 7 Jerusalem. And you can get those online as well. And um, it's like any other news type thing where they interview and talk amongst each other and give the up. But there's a lot of local news. They're uh, trying to get a new prime minister now. And those are all of those things are important pieces because they have a very liberal government now. And uh, what they're looking for is 
um, to replace that government because that was an ineffective prime minister and they couldn't form a government and a lot of problems politically in uh, Israel right now. And depending on who the not new prime minister is, maybe depending on how Israel responds to other things. And, and just keep up with what Iran is saying and what Russia is saying, because we have the prophecy of God. He named all the nations that will participate in that. And he, he, lives outside, he lives outside of my home. I don't look him at his house where it is. But he, uh, he was saying in his book, Revealing Revelation, that the Battle of Armageddon is going to be right there. He lives in Galilee um, and uh, closer to the Mount Carmel side. But he is within, um, he can see from his house over the Valley of Megiddo. But there is an Air Force base very close to him. And sometimes when you listen to him, you'll hear the jets take off. And he will sometimes say, this is an update. They're taking off and they're going to go and do such and such. He used to be, he was the last governor of Jericho. When several years ago, when Jericho was given back to the Palestinians as part of uh, some of the agreements that they made. And um, uh, he was a believer then as well. He was in the uh, military, military intelligence. He has, uh, he, he stayed in longer than his adult children have gone through their military requirements. Th men, three, women, two, every man and woman who has ability at all, unless they're very badly disabled, have to complete three years or two years in the military um, in Israel. And they have all sorts of jobs. Um, that's why it's called the Israeli Defense Forces. It's not, they're absolutely going with uh, um, Joshua's um, mode of war. Only when God says, and only in defense of the nation. They never are aggressive. In other words, uh, we want to take over Iran, so we'll do. <laughs> no, they don't do that. Now, they will defend themselves. And they have done some really good things to defend themselves. But you have to get local-based people telling you because... Um, Whoever's speaking here will depend on editorialize which things we want to cover and which we don't and how much time we'll give to it and whether we'll give them any time at all. So, but there's no Jews left in Ukraine because they covered when, before the uh, Russia entered, they saw it coming believed it was coming, understood from their intelligence, it's going to happen. And they got all Israel, all Jews who would leave. I'm, sure, I'm There may be some, but, and they had plane after plane after plane leave Ukraine and go to Tel Aviv and um, had a special way of welcoming, welcoming them as they do. And so, um, because they knew it was coming. And God said, I'm gathering all my people. And when I get them all gathered, then watch out. <laughs> that day's coming. That day's coming. But we've been told every bit of it. There's not a thing that's going to happen that he didn't. He always warns us about judgment. He never, ever sneaks up on anybody, the Lord. He always tells us. So we have time to prepare. Always the day of salvation until all of a sudden the doors close. Like Noah, I have all this time to get on this ark. Then suddenly the door closed the door. And that was it. Judgment began. Yes. Jews that are over here in America. What? Have to go back to Israel. All Jews, all God's people will go back. 
And they're doing that from America and every place else every day. Back when um, there was so much uh, persecution in France of Jewish people, Netanyahu was the prime minister then, and he went and spoke in the synagogues, and they loaded plane after plane, and every person in France who wanted to come. And that, prior to that time, was the place where the most Jews outside of Israel lived in France. And they left all their property and their stuff, got on planes and went to Jerusalem. That day's coming. Okay, anybody online want a question? <laughs> 